Okay, this is uh, Kit Dahl, uh, the council staff at the council offices. I'm just going to uh, begin with a few uh, general uh, logistical remarks about how the webinar works, and uh, then we'll move on from there. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first of a series of webinars on ecosystem indicators and that are being used in the council process. Um, we've pretty much done this, but uh, I just note uh, the members of the <clears throat> ecosystem work group that are currently logged on. So we've heard from most, most of you. Uh, they include Corey Niles, Cherise Schmidt, um, Deb Wilson Vandenberg, um, who else in this list? Um, it's expanding very quickly, but um, uh, Larry Gilbertson, Richard Scully, and uh, Cherise Schmidt, and Yvonne de Renier, the chair of the work group, and then also noting that um, the two uh, kind of lead folks from the NIMH Science Center um, Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team are also on the call. That's uh, Toby Garfield and Chris Harvey. Um, I won't go through a complete roll call of all of the people on the webinar. I think all of you have access to the um, list of attendees in the um, in the uh, in the control panel, go to meeting control panel, so you can at least see the names of people. Okay, um, just to note, this meeting, including the presentations and any chats, are recorded and will be posted on our website. So that if you want to uh, review any of it, you will, will be able to, or obviously for not on participating today, there will be an opportunity. Um, we are going to have one presentation today by uh, Toby Garfield from the um, NIMS Science Centers. And um, I'll just note that um, prior to that, Yvonne de Renier is going to provide some introductory remarks. During the first part with the presentations, uh, the participants will be muted on our end. We, we do have the members of the ecosystem work group uh, unmuted, along with obviously Toby and also Chris. Um, Toby has told us that he will pause every so often to answer any questions that are specifically about elements in his presentation. And um, to facilitate this, we're asking that you submit your question using the chat function, which is at the bottom of the GoToMeeting control panel. Uh, you may need to um, click on the plus sign to, to open it up or maximize it so you can see the chat box. And uh, it should be pretty straightforward. You, you have a choice of um, sending uh, chats to everybody or selected people. Probably want to send them to everybody. I'm just going to, I just sent out a um, chat to everybody to flag where that chat box is. Um, after Toby's presentation, the EWG will lead a discussion focused on today's presentation top topic. At that point, we're going to unmute everybody but please use the hand raise feature in GoToMeeting uh, to indicate if you have a comment or question. That way we don't get people talking over each other. As much as possible, I will recognize hands in the following order. First, ecosystem work group members, then members of other council advisory bodies, and then the general public. Uh, I'll try. I may not recognize everybody uh, who's on all of our many um, groups or committees. I, I can't guarantee that order. But um, Also, as we've already probably um, mentioned, to reduce uh, any background noise on your end, um, it, 
it helps a lot for you to mute your phone and mic and, and then when you're ready to make a comment or ask a question, unmute on your end. Uh, and obviously through the process I've described, we'll uh, unmute you on our end and you can ask a question. So um, during the discussion portion after the presentation, we'll go to having people verbalize their questions and um, you know, as much as possible facilitate a good uh, back and forth rather than, as I mentioned, for questions on, on the presentation, during the presentation, um, to submit those using the chat function. Um, and then finally, um, just uh, if you are having technical issues, uh, call Chris Kleinschmidt at, in our office here, his phone number. I already read it out, but it's 503-820-2425. Uh, it's, it's also in the information, the meeting announcement on our website if you need to um, refer to that in a crunch. So that concludes my overview. I'm going to turn over the talking to Yvonne. So um, take it from here. Thank you, Kit. I have unmuted from my end. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon and Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to our first Ecosystem Indicators webinar. To give you all a quick bit of background, we're conducting these webinars to kick off the Pacific Council's second Fishery Ecosystem Plan initiative. When the Council adopted its Fishery Ecosystem Plan in 2013, it decided to explore different issues that might affect two or more of its fishery management plans as ecosystem initiatives. You may be familiar with the Council's first ecosystem initiative to protect on-fish forage fish, which they finished up in September 2015 and which is now under public and National Marine Fishery Service review as a group of amendments to the Council's four fishery management plans. This second initiative that we're kicking off here today is somewhat different and is not focused on changes in Council regulations. The Fishery Ecosystem Plan asks the National Marine Fishery Service to provide it with an annual ecosystem status report at each March Council meeting. And in March 2016, we'll see the fourth such report for our California current ecosystem. If you work in or are familiar with the North Pacific Council system, they have been producing um, ecosystem considerations reports for many years now. So these webinars that we're holding uh, here in January and the last one in early February are not intended to affect the 2016 ecosystem report that will come out in March. We are anticipating that council advisory bodies and the public will have opportunities to comment on this initiative and the report's contents in March, June, and September of 2016. In September 2016, uh, the Council is going to distill all of our advice and provide recommendations on the contents of the 2017 report and we'll then decide whether to continue this discussion into 2017 and beyond for 2018 and beyond reports. So, this initiative is intended to get the Council family, its advisory bodies, the larger public, scientists and decision makers with less frequent Council interactions familiar with the general contents of the annual ecosystem status report and discussing whether that information is useful for or informative to fisheries management decision making and to seek any ideas you may have for other or different information. Although ideas about and comments on the scientific merits of the report's contents are welcome, the Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee has the primary responsibility for that type of scientific review and they have already taken a hard look at the report and its contents. Um, what the Scientific and Statistical Committee specifically asked for, of the larger council advisory bodies and for a broad public discussion is how do we think the report's contents can better support West Coast fisheries management? So um, as Kit mentioned, much of the report's contents come from the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment which is conducted by our fisheries services Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers. Dr. Chris Harvey of Northwest and Dr. Toby Garfield of Southwest are our current leads on the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team. 
and Toby Garfield, who is also the director of the Southwest Center's Environmental Research Division, is leading off the presentations with today's discussion of physical indicators. And Thursday of this week, which is the 14th, we will have our second um, presentation on biological indicators. So with that uh, hopefully quick introduction, uh, Kit, would you please turn over the presentation to Toby so that he can give us our, our physical indicators presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'm turning the screen over to Toby. Okay, does that work? Yeah. Okay, um, oh, good. I, originally I couldn't see the chat function, I can now see it. So, um, thank you very much. I want to thank Kit and Yvonne uh, for the introduction, and I thank the uh, ad, ad hoc uh, ecosystem working group for inviting the California Current IEA team uh, to present. Um, so, I guess the IEA program, um, Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Program, is about eight years in the making, and the California Current IEA uh, effort has uh, produced three full reports up till now. Uh, the first report was primarily a scoping document, and the last two have been much more full reports to the extent possible with funding and, and people resources. Um, each of these full reports is over 400 pages long, and over 50 people have contributed to each. Um, so I mentioned this so it's clear that the speakers for each of these uh, webinars, uh, each of these five webinars, are representing a lot of effort by a lot of people, and I'm sorry I don't have a slide showing everybody involved. Um, I did see that Phil Levin logged on, and I think Phil should be acknowledged as uh, one of the prime movers in making this happen on the California coast. Um, for the last three years, the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team has presented the annual California Current Ecosystem Status Report to the Council at its March meeting, as Yvonne mentioned. Um, the written report has to be limited to 20 pages, so obviously a great deal of selection goes into trimming down a 400-plus page document to uh, that which we present to the Council. Uh, as Yvonne said, the Council has requested that the Ad Hoc Ecosystem Working Group review the indicators that are available through the IDA and decide uh, which indices or indicators should be included. So today is the first of five webinars uh, presented by different members of the California Current IEA team. Um, today I'll be presenting the background material and the indicators that uh, are reviewed and included in the, in the report, as well as some background information on the ecosystem uh, indicators. Uh, this is really a repeat of, of what Yvonne just said, but the Council has requested a March report and the report is to provide indicators that improve understanding of the status and function of the ecosystem parameters relevant to the decision-making um, process. So why develop an ecosystem assessment? And this is really just a quick review, but uh, you know, up until recently, single stock species assessment has been the primary way of managing um, uh, fisheries. Uh, for decades, NOAA has had the goal of developing EBFM, but until recently, have lacked the tools and the framework to do it. And the IEA, a national effort, provided that necessary framework. So think of the IEA as the science needed to move from single stock assessments to a more integrated approach, and you kind of work your way up this, that uh, you bring ecosystem consideration into um, fishery management through the ecosystem approach to fisheries management, then you move up the ladder to ecosystem-based fisheries management. And finally, when you bring in the whole scope of human dimensions as well, as they are both uh, um, beneficiary and also influence on fisheries, you get towards ecosystem-based management. Um, I think it's also important to emphasize at this point that the IEA also directs the regional action plans for climate change strategy, and that's an effort that um, NOAA is pushing very hard right now to develop a climate change strategy, and so the IEA is, is contributing to that as well. 
So, how to go about developing the indicators? You've got to start with the management goals. You have to have defined management goals. Uh, and then once you have those goals, you need to decide on those focal components of the ecosystem that most represent influencing those goals. And once you've done that part of it, then you want to look at the key attrib attributions that moderate those focal uh, components. And then finally, indicators are the physical measurements you can use to talk about those uh, key attributes. And I put down here on that box that one of the challenges for the California current large marine ecosystem is that it's really driven from below by ecosystem variability. Uh, coastal upwelling is, is critical. Um, but it's also driven from above by anthropogenic pressures. So the EBFM goals are, are going to have to balance pressures uh, from both below and above. So as I said, a key attribute are the characteristics that define the structure, composition, function of focal ecosystem components. Those, those components that you think management needs to uh, pay attention to. And an indicator is a quantitative measurement that serves as proxies for characterizing those key attributes. Uh, an example, uh, we'll take a human example. Let's say that uh, human health or human heart health is the attribute you want to study. And measuring cholesterol would be an indicator of the value or the state of your health. And um, I just want to point out the two graphs um, on the bottom there. On the left, if you um, on uh, this graph, <clears throat> for an indicator to be informative, it has to be able to show trends that are relevant to what it is you want to measure versus, say, on the right here, a scatter plot that doesn't really show trends. That would be a very poor indicator and not useful. So for the California current large marine ecosystem, the IEA team, as they assembled, um, they looked at the ecosystem based management components that are probably critical for the managers. And you see that list on the right hand side there, the wild fisheries, seafood, protected resources, habitat, ecosystem health or condition, vibrant coastal communities, and scientific knowledge. And so the management strategies wants to look at those components. And then on the left hand side are the drivers and pressures that they have to pay attention to that could really impact uh, those components. So shipping, fresh and marine habitat, coastal zone development, fishing, invasive species, so on down the line there. You can read those faster than I can say them. Uh, but the point is that there are both uh, natural pressures and drivers and anthropogenic pressures and drivers. And these are, these are what we have to base uh, the system on. So the uh, California Current IEA has developed three tools for really discussing and presenting the indices. On the top here, we have a status and trend plot. This is where you have a long time series of data, so you've got a history, um, where you can plot. So your x-axis would be the year, in this case, in this example. Um, the y-axis would be the range of the particular parameter or indice of, of interest, and excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, and then on that plot, the dashed line would be the mean of that value. The solid lines would be the standard deviations. The data itself are plotted as black dots with a red line. I'm sorry for people who can't see the colors. Um, and with that is also the variation. So if it's uh, multiple data points averaged together, mm -hmm. you get a standard deviation or an estimate of the variance. The last five years on the right-hand side, or some period like that, are colored uh, green there so that you can quickly focus in and look at the trend over the last couple of years. And so in this case, we see a rising trend. Um, and the symbols on the right-hand side, uh, the arrow pointing up there means that the trend has been rising over the last five years. And the dot below it means it's been primarily within the, the range of values, standard deviation range of values. Um, those, that top symbol could be rising, lowering, or steady, and the um, lower symbol could be positive, negative, or the dot, meaning within the expected values. 
So that's one way we present the data. We can show how things have changed over time. Uh, the next way is the conceptual models on the lower left, where um, we have these very complete, layered, and complex integrated conceptual models of the California current system. Each element in the conceptual model uh, relates to system attributes that are considered critical for management and are linked to these indicators uh, that can represent a pressure or on the attribute. And so if you were to, you'll see that sort of on the left-hand side of this are the more natural uh, ind indicators of integrity, and on the right-hand side are much more uh, human well-being and anthropogenic influences. If you click on any one of the symbols here, you'll go into another layer that will show how that uh, expands out. And I think um, over the course of these webinars, you're going to see a number of examples of these. I, I didn't uh, go through a series of them yet, but you'll see them. Um, and then the final way of presenting some of this data are through risk analyses. So this is getting towards management decisions uh, where you look at a particular indicator and you can look at both how its exposure would change on the x-axis, how its sensitivity would change on the y-axis based on some decisions that are made. And you can see if that increases the risk to that indicator or lowers the risk to that indicator. And again, you'll see some examples um, of these, of each of these, as we progress through this series of webinars. So the indicators that were in last year's ecosystem report, the 20-page report that we presented to the council are listed here. So the four main categories are climate and ocean drivers, focal components of ecological integrity, human activities, human well-being. And each of those have a number of indicators uh, within them. And we are adding two new indicators for the presentation that will be this March, and that's habitat indicators and risk assessments. So we've had over the period of, of working with the IEA, we've been able to slowly develop further and further um, as resources uh, allow. So I'm going to talk about the climate and ocean drivers for a minute and then um, come up to one last point. So <clears throat> the basin scale indicators, okay, so these are the indicators of large-scale ocean atmospheric interaction that although they act on a Pacific basin scale, they actually have impact um, in the Northeast Pacific. And uh, the bottom one here, the summer uh, MEI, that's the multivariant El Nino index should have spelled it out, I apologize. Um, but the ENSO MEI there is probably the largest short-term driver because it impacts the uh, Northeast Pacific in three ways. Uh, the changing atmospheric patterns that in impact the rainfall and snow distribution, storms and upwelling. Uh, for those of us in Southern California, we would say in the last two weeks that the uh, El Nino uh, weather pattern has finally set in and we've had some pretty interesting rains. Uh, the second is that um, the El Nino phenomena generates coastally trapped waves that as they migrate up the coast, they travel from the equator up to the polar region. Um, they lower the thermocline and hence they have an impact on the primary productivity. And then the third way is that there can actually be an advection of waters from the south that are usually uh, more nutrient limited um, than the waters we see there. So again, impacting uh, the productivity. So an El Nino generally uh, suggests you're going to have lower productivity, although you're going to have some species change. You'll have the sardine anchovy shifts, et cetera. Um, but the other is that um, following an El Nino, we also get the opposite, which is a La Nina. And uh, that's tending back towards much more robust uh, conditions for productivity on the West Coast. And actually, if you look at this diagram, so some El Ninos here, we've got 1965, 73, uh, 83, the big one, and 98. Right after those, very often is a La Nina. So we sort of have an expectation that as we go through this current El Nino, we will then transition back to a uh, La Nina, which is the opposite overall basin scale conditions. And in the middle regions there, those are called Nino neutral conditions. Um, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is much more limited to uh, the North Pacific, and it really is a measure of um, 
the source waters that get into the California current. So a negative uh, PDO is generally colder, uh, more nutrient-rich waters, higher productivity in the area, whereas a positive PDO uh, is generally warmer along the California coast and in the California ecosystem. And uh, we expect generally lower productivity. Um, so there's an example of, of two indicators that we feel are important because they talk about the physical state of the large basin scale uh, as well as giving an indication of what the source waters would be at the bottom of the trophic level uh, for West Coast productivity. On the regional scale, upwelling is probably the most important uh, parameter for us to talk about because what makes eastern boundary current regions so productive is the fact that you have strong upwelling which brings cold nutrient rich water uh, to the surface, starts off the phytoplankton, starts off the whole um, productivity. And so again, we have um, a number, let's see, there's a couple of things I want to say about this plot. So first of all, um, summer, winter, uh, spring upwelling indices can be different, so we break it up by by uh, season. And the other is we have to break it up by region because the California current large marine ecosystem, of course, has some large scale regional differences um, in the in the wind field, and so that has to be reflected in how we talk about these indices. The other thing I want to say about this is this table here up at the top. Um, as I said, the, the IEA report is over 400 pages long. By the time you finish writing it, getting it reviewed, and get it published, it's more than two years out of date. And so um, we have now gone to putting all of our indices mm -hmm. web. And this is important because you'll be able to go on the web. If you click on any one of the indices, which got covered up here, if you click on any of the indices, what uh, it'll do, it'll bring up a dynamic plot that'll be plotting the most recent data that's been put into the database. So we won't be starting out with two-year-old plots. We'll be starting out with the most recent data available, which we figure is very important for the council process. The other is when you do those plots, when you bring one up on the right-hand side, there will be a short explanatory text uh, telling you what the most recent interpretation of the data is, are. And finally, these plots, we have developed a standard format for our plots, but by going to this web-based dynamic capability, the user can go in and customize the plots however they want. So if, you have a, if you're trying to work on a particular indice, uh, you'll be able to do that. So we think this is a very important advance over the last year in terms of getting our information out um, to the public. So why didn't I? Uh, for some reason, I'm not advancing. I don't know what's going on. Okay. So as I said, the, lar the, the California current large uh, marine ecosystem really stretches from Baja, California to British Columbia. And we talk about three sub-regions in that. The northern region, which has uh, much stronger storms. Um, you see seasonal wind stress reversals. You get significant freshwater input. Um, the middle region, which goes somewhere from between Cape Blanco and Cape Mendocino, that's not a fixed boundary, it fluctuates. Um, but that's the area where you have the winds are most uh, upwelling favorable, you get the strongest coastal upwelling, you get the development of the strong coastal jets and filaments that go offshore, uh, you don't have much freshwater input, um, and so the primary activity in that area is very strongly um, seasonal. And then south of around Point Conception, uh, we get an area that's generally much warmer, has fewer storms, weaker winds, much weaker local upwelling. So the water column itself has stable stratification, so you often find different populations of organisms in it. Uh, and again, you have very little um, um, freshwater input. So because of that, we feel that some of these, you know, there isn't one indice that's going to cover the whole California current uh, large marine ecosystem, very often um, you need to look, break them up regionally. So within the 400 plus page report, uh, we have the indicators that were divided into these eight categories, physical, fishery, so on down there. And you can see for each one of those, the number of indicators is fairly high. 
we actually, in the report, now we, we scanned a whole lot more indicators than that, but the report itself has 164 different indicators in it, and in fact, the report has just about 200 plots as well. Um, and that, those extra plots come in from doing regional uh, variations. Um, but obviously then, that indicator list uh, is much too large for the council process. So really, what we're entering into here is that process of looking at the indicators that we are able to um, pull into the report and deciding which ones are the ones that are most relevant to the fishery management process. The um, IA team developed a, a method of ranking the indicators. So these five considerations are the categories that are used. Uh, ecosystem condition, uh, ecosystem risk assessment, primary considerations, data considerations. Some of our data are very, are, you know, our data sets aren't long enough to really use as an indicator of change. And other considerations are the non-quantifiable uh, aspects of data that, that may or may not uh, be relevant. So with this matrix, there's actually 18 parameters that are used to evaluate uh, each indicator. And based on their score, we get an idea of how robust they are, how appropriate they would be uh, for consideration. And this matrix makes it relatively easy to either bring in new indices or to reevaluate uh, these indicators over time as conditions uh, change. So where we are is today is this uh, first uh, webinar. There are going to be four more. Uh, Thursday will be biological indicators. In two weeks, we'll start with human dimensions and habitat indicators and end up with uh, risk assessment and application for decision making. So I think these webinars will be able to carry you through in terms of showing the whole process and where the California Current IEA team is in terms of uh, developing a full ecosystem assessment. Um, and I want to end up with just talking about uh, what's happened over the last two years. And I, I do this because it, it shows how important it is to reassess and reexamine the indicators. And that is we had three uh, very important events uh, in the last year that um, would suggest changing some of the indices. So one is the warm anomalies, the blob, if you will. Uh, the other is the snow water equivalent, which was at record lows. And the third is the harmful algal blooms um, that have occurred uh, this last year. So um, this plot, if you're not used to a plot like this, it's a hav molar plot uh, on the uh, one axis. In this case, the x axis is time. So this is going for the last uh, three years from 2013 to just a couple days ago. Um, and on the y-axis here are latitude. And the top plot is the region where the blob uh, basically has resided for the last couple of years. Bottom plot is the warm anomaly that occurred off Southern California and Baja California. And you can see here these are color-coded. Um, Dark colors are cooler, uh, anomalously cool waters below the mean. Warm colors are, are warm waters. And what you see is that in the middle, starting in 2013, we started seeing the formation of the blob um, off of uh, the Northeast Pacific. It disappeared for a while, came back really, really strong in the summer of 2014, and was even stronger in the summer of 2015. So we've seen this development and persistence of this anomalously warm water, warmer than anything we had seen. So while we have measurements of that and we include them in our background material, up until this year, we actually hadn't figured, oh, these are really important. But uh, because we've seen um, so many displacements of species, so many exotic species showing up, we realized that our last year's written report didn't talk about the blob. Our oral presentation to the council did. So in that short span of time, uh, we realized that this was an indicator that should be included. Uh, down below, you see that the development of the warm water off Baja uh, didn't start until 2014, but again, was equally very strong in 2015. Uh, the other example is snow water equivalent. Again, a parameter that we had in our back pocket that we've been monitoring, but hadn't really shown. If you look at the early years here uh, down in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Valley, 
pretty much stay just within the standard deviation. So it just seemed as though it trucked along and wasn't going to show any change until this last year where uh, the snow water equivalent is down to 5% of normal. So obviously a uh, huge change in terms of ecosystem uh, suggesting that we should shift uh, one of our indicators to make it much more important and uh, more primary. And then the last one, of course, is, is um, the halves this year that, that so impacted um, invertebrate uh, species, fishery species. So again, in our last report, halves were listed as a new biologic concern, but again, we hadn't really thought about what's the best way to come up with an indice um, that would help maintain and indicate ecosystem health. So with those, we have these three events, the blob, no water equivalent, HABs, um, that point out the need for a regular assessment of the indices used to describe ecosystem uh, health and change. And I realized I forgot to stop and ask for questions in the middle of this, so um, I will just stop now and apologize and open it up for discussion. Oh, I guess I have to give away, don't I? Or you can take it back. Okay, Toby. Um, yeah, you can leave it on. Uh, we'll leave you as presenter for the time being in case you, there was okay. a desire to refer back to any of your slides. Um, so we'll take questions orally. I. I uh, didn't see any text chats, however, Andrew um, Lit Lacing has his hand raised and I've unmuted you. If you do in fact want to ask a question, you may do so. Andrew, you may still be muted on your end. To unmute if you okay, want to talk. Otherwise, okay, well, um, I guess we'll move on unless Andrew um, wants to unmute himself or whatever and ask a question. Hey, Kent, this is Corey. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, hey, Toby, thank you. Uh, and I'm getting an echo on myself, so I'll try to get the question out without question out. interrupting myself. But uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I've been asked or been volunteered to uh, help kind of get questions going here from the Ecosystem Working Group. Um, and I guess um, I'll leave off one of the, I think the, a common feeling you'll hear around the council and its advisors and the public is, um, we all find the indicator reports, annual reports we get as, as interesting, um, but I guess the, 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 one of the reasons we're here is how do we get beyond these are interesting and um, as you said, the, um, the ultimate indicator, I, if you call it, would, would, would connect directly to a management goal and it's maybe I guess tough for a lot of us to um, see how these large scale oceanographic um, um, indicators really connect to anything that the council um, can control and I guess short of Pacific Sardine we haven't um, really been seeing a quantitative connection between uh, something like an oceanographic factor and and the stock assessment advice we get so um, could you help you know like sell people help us um, understand like what 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 these oceanographic um, indicators can do for the council short of being able to feed it into a stock assessment? Um, is it UC benefits just from being everyone, just being, these aren't, aren't things a lot of people think about normally, is there just, is there benefits to being more literate about what's going on in the ecosystem? And if not, should we really be trying to, to get you guys working with our stock assessment folks to uh, get those, get these types of information 
directly fed into our harvest control rules. If, and if, I were, if I were allowed to, I'd ask Phil Levin to answer that. But I will answer that um, to the best of my ability as a physical oceanographer, and then I'll let uh, Chris Harvey chime in if he wants to as well. Um, I think there are a couple of, of parts to answering this. Um, one is that part of the problem uh, in terms of coming up with really good indicators are the gaps in our knowledge. So I think we feel from a physical oceanography, hey, the physics is easy, we pretty much understand it. Um, and then the next real indicator we use is uh, copepods. So we're we're missing uh, we're missing some some steps in there. And if we had more information on some of these steps, would it be easier to use these indicators to come up with a better idea of what may or may not happen in the future? Um, secondarily, a lot of these species that, that you all are trying to manage, um, the life histories aren't known that well. So some of these gaps just fall into a void because there are areas where we probably don't have enough information. And I think the third is that we have to acknowledge that fisheries are going to continually undergo increasing pressure, both through human population growth and through climate change. That I think it is fair to say we are, we are going to continually apply pressure to all of these stocks. And so I think it's really in everybody's uh, interest that we develop a mechanism that goes beyond single stock assessment that actually um, allows you to think about, I've got X amount of total biomass, what is the best way to manage it? And I think if anybody else on the team wants to weigh in and, and expand on that answer, it would be great. This is uh, Chris Harvey. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes, now we no. can. Now we can. Thank you, thank you. Um, so just a couple of uh, comments to uh, follow up on what Toby said. Uh, one of the uh, real gaps in uh, in fishery science, uh, as I think everyone's probably aware, uh, are the integration of of ecosystem scale variables into stock assessments. And Toby alluded to that. And I think one of the things that we should be looking to do, especially with species on the west coast that are so affected by things like um, recruitment variability uh, in the uh, the exclusively marine fish, uh, or um, or the effects of uh, freshwater conditions uh, on salmon. Uh, the oceanographic variables that Toby uh, showed uh, could potentially be linked statistically or mechanistically to really important factors in the life histories and population uh, biology of these species that we are really care about. So let's say uh, something to do with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO variable that Toby showed, uh, affects the recruitment of rockfish or sablefish. Uh, or let's say whether there's an El Nino or not uh, has a strong uh, bearing on where hake go or how strong hake recruitment is. Uh, these are all the kinds of things that uh, can inform management either directly through stock assessment or at least through uh, some uh, more general information that will help um, uh, inform whether management, let's say, should be more precautionary this year than it's been in the past. And then another thing I think that we saw this past year uh, with uh, a lot of the climate variability or the, the climate anomaly, rather, the warmer than expected water that, that uh, Toby described was that it pushed uh, a lot of species in very close to shore. Uh, and those not just uh, fish species, but also protected species like whales. And uh, so, uh, understanding the way these physical variables are behaving in time and space gives us a, a lot of information on where the fish are likely to be. And that can be beneficial in terms of um, a better understanding of where it's best to allocate effort, uh, so spatial management or spatial harvest practices, and also knowing which areas you might want to avoid uh, fishing because there might be a greater ab abundance of, let's say, sea turtles or marine mammals uh, or uh, other protected species in those areas. Uh, these species are all uh, highly mobile for the most part and uh, respond very, uh, very uh, you know, dynamically to 
the physical conditions. And so if we don't understand the physical conditions, we're more or less cheating ourselves out of really valuable information that could help us manage those species more effectively. I think maybe I'll just, while I have a second here, um, just a couple of other things that we are uh, keeping track of too, besides just those physical uh, indicators that Toby showed, we've reported on dissolved oxygen concentrations and ocean acidification. <laughs> and I think it's pretty clear uh, that uh, the problems with low dissolved oxygen in bottom waters or problems with uh, high levels of, uh, of uh, of acidified or of high volumes of acidified waters uh, can have a, a very important bearing on the distribution and the condition of uh, marine species, uh, many of which uh, we are trying to harvest. I, I think I would add to this too. In the last report, um, Brian Wells led an effort to really try and and do an ecosystem approach to salmon and really try to talk about both the freshwater habitat, the early entry, and, and some of the recruitment issues. Um, again, with the poor snow water equivalent this year, three years from now, we might see dramatically different salmon returns. So there are a couple of species where we are trying to do a much more integrated approach. And this is Cerise. I had a question sort of to follow up on that. Um, on your indices, you have you know, a an arrow to summarize what the trend is in the last five years for each of the indexes. And does that trend, in your mind, uh, for portend for what the next years might be? If it's, have you done an analysis or the information to indicate that if we're seeing the trend in uh, pointing upward, for example, in the 2016 report that um, there's a, a better than even chance it will be up again for the 2017. I'm just thinking about applying the information to from the past to future decisions. I, I really I, I, think I, I think that depends on uh, which indicator you're looking at. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you're if you're looking at an indicator that has a short response time, then no, you couldn't do it. If you're looking at an indicator, uh, say like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, maybe. But none of these are really trying to predict the future. They're really just reporting what we've seen so far. So I, I think uh, the predictive capabilities, you know, everybody said last year we we're going to have the mother of all El Ninos, and it quickly fizzled out, and we're having it this year. So. Um, I think it's very difficult to take these indicators and, and project them forward based on the tools that we're using at this point. Um, there are some modeling efforts going on, but uh, again, their, their predictive capability is limited at best. And, it, and I totally agree with that. And I guess I was thinking that it might be worthwhile at some point maybe you've already done this in, in your you know, more comprehensive reports to give some sense of those that are uh, maybe shorter term and, and others that might be more longer term in, in the sense that you just described, just as a way of alerting people that the trend line does, does not necessarily mean that that's going to be the case next year, for example. This is Yvonne. I had a sort of question, sort of comment. Um, the, so the council, as you know, is interested in the effects of some of these um, indicators or phenomena on the species that they manage. And some of these effects may be farther down the road. And so this might be what's coming up in management strategy evaluations, but information about some of these um, indicators, like, uh, for example, in El Nino years, we tend to see more or less recruits from this or that species, and which ultimately means that 
um, five years hence we're going to have more or fewer adults available to the fishery or something like that. So sort of um, where can we find information about the effects of some of these uh, physical phenomena on the species that we manage? I think the various sections, so I think this last report, which says it was published 2013, we actually didn't publish it till 2015, um, that report was, we much more tried to integrate the various chapters so that the environmental conditions were pulled into, say, the CPS or the groundfish um, to do, start doing exactly what the question you're asking, Yvonne. I don't, I don't think we're there yet. I think there's still a lot more work to do, but we have definitely started trying to incorporate that into the assessments. And uh, in the risk assessment uh, portion of the IEA, one of the things that has been attempted at least for, uh, for a coastal pelagic species, uh, I believe probably also for salmon in the case of the Wells chapter that Toby mentioned before, um, and um, uh, certainly we could uh, uh, push on this for, for other species too. There, there are a lot of the risk assessment involves looking at uh, the sensitivity of specific life history stages of particular species uh, to different uh, climate forms of climate variability. Uh, so uh, that is certainly one way that we could uh, categorize uh, the physical variabilities uh, that are, are the ones that the council needs to pay most attention to. Uh, or th that could be candidates for inclusion either in a stock assessment uh, analysis uh, to improve stock assessment fits with an environmental variable or uh, via uh, a management strategy evaluation, uh, perhaps along the lines of, a, of a, a model that we might build from scratch uh, or a big ecosystem model like Isaac Kaplan has developed. Uh, or maybe even a, a management strategy evaluation that is entirely contained within a stock assessment framework. And I think that's what's happening with Pacific Hake uh, that um, um, Alan uh, Hicks is working on, but I'm not 100% sure of that. But um, that, that's certainly one way that, uh, that we have already started approaching it uh, and that we could try to make uh, more present in our uh, reporting uh, to the council. I think that will come up in the risk assessment webinar, which is the fifth one that Jamil Samhuri and uh, Elliot Hazen will be giving. And that would also potentially get into areas, Yvonne, like, um, like when climate is more likely uh, to be pushing a protected species into uh, the, the line of fire, if you will, of different fishing gears. Uh, Richard? Scully, did you have a comment or question? I did see your hand raised a little while ago. Um, yeah, yeah, I did. I, but at this point, it might not be kind of gone past a little bit. But my, I guess my my question was that if the salmon stock assessment personnel would have included the the blob impact on distribution of, of salmon that were sampled last year, do you think that that would uh, have, is there a way to, to, to maybe more fine tune the stock assessment by, by including that, that kind of great temperature change? Uh, as you said, some mm -hmm. species were pushed in closer to the coast and maybe they weren't distributed as they normally are. Um, do, you, do you see a way to, I mean, it, you can say, well, it's happening, but how do we quantitatively um, use that information to modify models? Uh, I, I think part of the answer is, and I'm going to truly duck the, the, base, the, the main part of your uh, question, but I do think Bill Peterson's Popopod Index, which is just on the Newport line, so it's restricted to one area, it's not, not the whole region, uh, but certainly his, his copepod index of north-south uh, species um, probably did a very good job of reflecting a major part of the impact of the warm blob. So that he was seeing a lot more southern species. I think he, 
seen like uh, I can't remember it was over 10 species that he had never collected on his line again southern species so um, I think that kind of information with then the, the lipid content the food content of those copepods probably is a good way to start bringing that kind of material into the consideration um, beyond that I'm not enough of a biologist to really or stock assessment person to be comfortable answering I would I would echo that. I'm not sure if any of the salmon group is on the line right now. It doesn't look like it from at first glance, but but uh, I think uh, I think Richard, one of the things that really stands out to me in in your question is uh, a reminder to us that uh, that a lot of our engagement process has been with say the council with the uh, protected resources division uh, of the Western Region with the sanctuaries uh, and we need to also be remembering to engage uh, the stock assessment biologists uh, and uh, we, we do have a, a large team but we're also spread somewhat thinly uh, but um, uh, your question does call to mind uh, at least one uh, presentation I've seen recently by Pete Lawson who is uh, here at the Northwest Center and in a lot of the uh, empirical work that he's done where they've gone out and sampled uh, coated wire tagged uh, salmon that were caught uh, at sea uh, it does look like they are quite sensitive to temperature uh, and their distribution certainly uh, uh, shift accordingly uh, but how he incorporates that or how those those in oh, those data would be incorporated into a stock assessment I honestly don't know either uh, but uh, point taken that we need to uh, be in closer contact with the uh, with the assessment biologists at both labs Oh, I see Deb Wilson Vandenberg. You have your hand up. Do you have a comment? Yeah, kind of a question. Um, I enjoyed the discussion towards the end about um, some of the lag times in what you see in these indicators, and then when you may see some effect from that down the road. And obviously, it seems that's going to be highly variable depending on what the indicator is and what the species you're interested in is and, and that kind of thing. But I'm curious, given that in the council world, um, most folks aren't going to be reading the IEA document. They may be looking at the annual report. Can you think of or have you considered ways that you could visually um, or otherwise depict some of those lag times for, for key species of interest? We've certainly talked about it, and we have uh, batted around a few ideas, but we are still in the exploratory um, stage of doing that. And it, it, large part, becomes a resource issue for us. I wanted to ask if there are any members of any council advisory bodies who had any questions for Toby or Chris? And just uh, to interject, we we do have. Um, I have to apologize. I have. I said I was going to unmute folks, so let me um, go ahead and do that. Thank you, Kit. So uh, is anyone in 
anyone from any of the advisory bodies having a question or is there anyone from members of the public? And I also see a couple names from the North Pacific. So if you have any questions or wisdom you'd like to offer, that would be great too. all unmuted now from the council end. If you could mute yourselves, that would be helpful from your ends. suppose is okay, but uh, if anyone has any questions, please speak up, and if you're typing, please mute. Okay, well, it sounds like we've devolved into the usual webinar mess. Uh, before we disengage for today, uh, I feel like we should have more opportunities for questions from the public, but if you don't have any questions, then we can't force you to ask them. Um, but uh, I didn't want to let Toby and Chris go just yet until a final check for questions. And if either Toby or Chris have any closing remarks that they want to make, that would be fine too. Um, otherwise, we will stop taking up your time and end the webinar. I, I have a question. This is Richard. Um, can, can, I don't know who's looking at the screen, but can you see my question hand up there or, or not? Maybe, maybe I'm just not getting it to, the, to you. Anyway, I'll go, go ahead and ask the question to um, the IEA uh, scientists. Uh, are there other additional physical parameters that, that you think should be monitored? Are, uh, I, you know, funding is limited and you can't just say, well, I'd like to monitor this, give me some more money, but is there, is there a gap there that you, you see uh, after looking at all your information that it would be nice or very useful to have some information on, on, a, on a parameter that kind of falls between, falls in the crack, so to speak. Uh, can, can anybody hear me? We can. Okay. Well, anyway, apparently there's no response to that. There we, there we go. We were muted. Sorry about that, Richard. Uh, Toby, you want to take that first? Can uh, Can you make sure Toby is unmuted? Well, maybe uh, maybe once uh, we'll, while Toby is getting unmuted uh, uh, or. Uh, uh, thinking about his answer, uh, one thing that I think we uh, have said in a couple of our reports that we're not tracking as well as we'd like to uh, are uh, solved oxygen levels and uh, ocean acidification uh, in the form of whether it's pH uh, or um, other measures of of ocean acidification, and uh, that's probably as much as anything. It's a matter of um, of we haven't pulled together all the data that are available, and NOAA and uh, in, in other agencies and at state and federal levels 
are putting a lot more effort into monitoring those variables as they've got more attention. So we're hoping we can uh, improve the, the quality of our OA and our hypoxia um, uh, uh, indicators in the, in the near future. I think another thing that is uh, quite stark is, uh, Toby can give you a lot more information about this than, than I can, but uh, the coverage of oceanographic uh, measures in the southern part of the California current is vastly superior mm -hmm. to the northern part thanks to all the work being done in the Cal Coffee area, and there are only a few uh, areas in the northern part of the California current where we have comparable coverage. Uh, and so we, we get a lot of information from Bill Peterson's uh, transect off of Newport, uh, but the Newport line is, is representative of, certainly of the area off of uh, central southern Oregon, uh, perhaps Washington too, uh, but um, there are other parts of the central and northern part of the California current that that line probably doesn't represent nearly as well. And when we have, uh, you know, lots of different salmon stocks, let's say, going to sea from different rivers and watersheds um, from California all the way up to Washington, uh, using one line of, uh, of mm -hmm. oceanographic data to get some sense of, of conditions for all of those different salmon stocks is probably uh, not doing really, you know, full service to them. And that is an area for a tremendous amount of investment uh, need uh, for uh, for monitoring. Uh, Toby, are you on now? And would you like to take the rest of this uh, this question? Yeah, yeah. And I'll see if I can remember the elegant answer I gave Richard while I was muted. Um, <laughs> I think part of it is Richard. You got to remember, we're not collecting any data, so we are at the mercy of all the other efforts. That stated. Um, I think it's pretty easy to say that we need more data collection, and I'm competing with somebody. Um, and, and so I, I think one of the things that the IEA needs to help no, push is how do we how do we progress towards adaptive sampling? Uh, because I think that's going to be very important because we undersample almost everything. Uh, going out on a ship and just mowing the lawn the same way every time is not using our ships intelligently. We need to. Uh, figure out how we can use AUVs, other autonomous vehicles, uh, and be much more strategic with our use of ships and how we actually monitor what's going on. So I see Corey has his uh, hand raised. Uh, I think you will need to unmute if you want to talk. No, I'm working right now. Sorry, we can hear you, but we can hear other people. Deb, did you have a question, or did I? your hand up for from before. I, I did have a question, I but I was question. still waiting to hear Corey. Well, maybe Debbie could go ahead with your question, and maybe Corey and Kleinschmidt can figure it out. Here's his okay. problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my question, I'm looking at this lovely figure here with the snow water equivalent, and um, one of the things I've thought about through these annual reports is um, I, I get that the length of time that's, that's shown in a lot of these indicators is very much dependent on the data that are available, but I... I also wonder at some point um, how the IEA team decides how much of those data do you actually want to include in one of the indicators. And I think that last one for, Sam, for Sacramento, San Joaquin um, area is so instructive because on the one hand you would think, well, why do you need 100 years of data? On the other hand, it's not until you get to the end of the 100 year period that you really see something. Striking. So I was just curious um, how you go about doing that and, and 
what goes into that. And likewise with the end period, the five-year trend, is that kind of an arbitrary choice or, or how that's made? So I can't remember all. Oh, so first of all, we want to show as much data as is available. I mean, that's sort of the rule of thumb. Um, the National Weather Service, when they're computing means, they use a 30-year decadal period. So every 10 years, their, their mean shifts. Um, we have debated the mean and standard deviation. Should we do it on the entire data set? Should we do it as, as the National Weather Service? Um, one of the important points is that that five-year data set is sort of like, well, this is the period that impacts a lot of species, not the short-lived species, but the longer-lived species. So we're sort of in between there. But with our flexible plotting tool, anybody can go in and change any one of those parameters. So none of them are fixed. We just kind of came up with, and, and the Alaska people also actually originally developed um, this status and trend plot. We just came up with the five year as, as kind of representative of the recent past. Um, but it's definitely not fixed. Um, it is, it can be changed and it can be adjusted. Uh, and you can go in if you want to just plot a shorter uh, portion of it, you, you can select the starting and end points as well. So um, I think the answer is we tried to develop a standardized way to present the data so that every plot had some uniformity in it. At the same time, we wanted to give the user, if they have special needs, the ability to customize the plots. I see that um, Teresa Labriola has her hand up. Teresa, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to go back quickly to the idea that, um, you know, of course we always want more data collection, but we don't have to just do the same data collection or mow the ocean or... Um, so I, I feel like what I'm hearing is that maybe there are some triggers um, and maybe they're not there yet, but maybe there are some triggers in terms of physical oceanography that would say this is when we should shift our data sampling in one direction or another to get a better picture of something. Am I hearing that correctly? Could the, could the part of the IEA and, and maybe it's physical triggers um, help us? gather more intelligent data because it, it's it's um, maybe more relevant or, or more correlative? I, I think part of the problem that we would all love to develop are triggers, but we've got to remember that all of these species are really, most of them are fairly mobile, and if conditions change, they're going to move. And so a lot of this is understanding how these species will move under changing conditions as opposed to a simple trigger. And so I think, I, I wish there were um, some indices that we thought would be, you know, there are some we know, hypoxia, we know there's going to be some dramatic uh, influences there. Uh, in terms of ocean acidification, really the aragonite saturation state is, is going to be probably a relatively important trigger. So there are some definite triggers, but at the same time, uh, you've got to be real careful on that just because of the mobility of so many of these species. Yeah, I would add uh, that if we were to, if we were to be changing um, things too often, and Teresa, I'm sure this isn't exactly what you're asking. I just want to make sure that it's clear. If we were just chasing uh, around indicators uh, in anticipation of something possibly changing or not, we could end up missing out on some other things that we had been uh, monitoring for a, a longer period of time. So we, in some ways, we designed the indicator sets that we uh, came up with uh, so that they would be robust to a lot of possibilities. They would be good indicators of when times were good and stable uh, or good indicators of when times were bad and stable or uh, most importantly, good uh, indicators of transitions between states. And we hopefully have that all covered. But on the other hand, uh, your point is a very good one in the, in the case of something like harmful algal blooms, which Toby mentioned uh, uh, is something that we had not included in the report. 
uh, it's important to note that just because something isn't in the report certainly doesn't mean that it's not being monitored somewhere. It's just that uh, in the constraints of the space and the time we really have uh, to uh, to interact with the council, we have to keep uh, things at some something of a select level. Mm -hmm. But if uh, the process that we're working on here with the ecosystem work group and with all the advisory bodies uh, enables us uh, to be a little bit more flexible in terms of things that we can report on when they're important, provided that we have a good time series of data so we can show that yes, it's important and yes, it's changing or yes, it's important and it's stable or, or whatever the condition is, uh, that would ideally be uh, the, the, the case where we would be able to uh, to incorporate some new findings, uh, or not new findings, pardon me, uh, incorporate new time series uh, that are relevant uh, to management at a particular uh, time and place. I also want to just make sure um, that there's been some work in the IEA group at looking at indicators that involve uh, thresholds um, and, um, and where maybe more than one indicator was working together. Uh, uh, to uh, cause some unexpected change, and we are certainly uh, uh, trying to work on that kind of problem too. I think that will come up in the fifth webinar that Jamil Samhuri and Elliot Hazen are leading, but uh, just in case either one of them wants to comment on that right now, I just uh, step back uh, and let one of them chime in if they want to. Uh, Elliot hasn't been able to get his uh, audio working, so. I don't think I've been able to get it working. Can you guys hear me at all? Yes, yes. I can. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, yeah, the, basically, I'll, I'll talk quickly and let hand over to Jamil, but the goal is to basically look at whether we can assign reference points either from the data themselves to look for are there these points where we transition from one kind of ecosystem state to the next using some of the IEA indicators. But I think the, the key point that was brought up is just because an indicator isn't in the IEA, a lot of times we're limited just based on the time series of our indicators and our, which will essentially limit our ability to make inference from these uh, multi-indicator analyses as well. Hey, this is Jamil. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I guess Elliot covered that pretty well. The only thing I'd add is that um, earlier versions of the IEA did show some different demonstration products of ways to think about the indicators collectively. Um, and so, for instance, plotting the indicators in a space that on one axis would represent whether they were early warning or lagging indicators, and on another axis would represent whether they were broad or highly specific. And so that's a pretty good method for um, identifying where there are gaps in that, um, in that, in those two dimensions, and there are other ways to do that. So if that's of interest to the ecosystem working group by the council, that's those are the sorts of products that we can pull together and give a given the indicators we're currently using and use to identify um, places we maybe should be looking for additional ecosystem information. Uh, Phil Levin also just noted to me uh, something that's good to mention is that the uh, Alaska Fishery Science Center in their ecosystem reporting often includes something called a hot topic indicator. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing, maybe, Teresa, that uh, could be uh, used to address the, 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 your question, where if, uh, if there is something going on that's, that's exceptional, uh, like the warm bob, like the die-off of the uh, juvenile sea lions, or like the HABs, or, uh, or just some other really pressing issue uh, that um, as, as we're able to in our interactions with uh, Council advisors and the uh, and the working group um, to uh, to have some of those on uh, at the ready to include in our reporting. We certainly uh, can, can do that. Thanks, guys, for this discussion. I got a lot more out of it than my question even asked. So thanks. <laughs> So uh, Corey emailed me his question, and he, the question he was trying to ask was, um, would the indicators that are in the report now be the ones we'd expect to need to show a climate change signal? And if not, are there others that we would expect that would show changes or track the changes that we sort of most need to focus on for fisheries management?
and yes, You're that paint, is kind of a big, are, deep question. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that question kind of paints us into a corner, because I think the answer to that is we are still very much uh, coping with variability at this point. And if our indices are doing a good job of capturing the kind of variability we're seeing now, then we would expect when we get to the point where we can actually extract a climate change signal, we would be on the right track. How's that for ducking? <laughs> That's perfectly fine. <laughs> Kit, how are we doing on raised hands? Uh, right now, I'm not seeing any raised hands. I, w I was going to say, uh, I, at least looking at our list of attendees, that um, it appears that Corey's audio issues have been resolved. I don't know if Corey wants to say anything at this point or can, or can but uh, just noting that. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I don't know if you can yeah, hear me now. Kate, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. I heard myself echo back, so okay, yeah, thanks, Vaughn, for asking my question, and yeah, Chris, I didn't mean to paint you in a corner there, Toby. I heard you open up with, uh, you're trying to make the IEA making connections to climate change, and uh, Chris mentioned the, the ocean acidification and dissolved oxygen, and um, so yeah, my question was, by the time I was, uh, I was unmuted, I, I think you already had some of the discussion, but yeah, I was kind of just curious, what are the connections, how are you making those connections, you know, with climate climate change initiative and are they showing up in our, uh, where are the connections in our report? As Yvonne could tell you, we are still working on the very first draft of the climate change report and it's not, uh, at the moment it doesn't go into the specific details of exactly what we need to measure to do this. It's more, uh, it's a little bit higher level I would say at this point. Um, but I, I do think that everything we're doing uh, in the IEA and everything we're trying to do to assist the council is extremely relevant to also developing a climate change strategy. I think the two go hand in hand. So um, I would say stay tuned. Yeah, uh, the, the, actually the, uh, the slide that Toby has up on the, uh, on the board right now or on the screen right now might be uh, as good uh, a, an initial uh, start because I, I don't know if this for Toby can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it could very well be that it's easier for us to monitor uh, climate change in uh, the catchments that feed into the California current uh, than it is to, to monitor climate change in the in the uh, ecosystem itself uh, or in the marine part, you know, underwater. Uh, the uh, the other thing that I would I would want to mention is that. Um, Climate change is one of the explicit uh, mandates of the IEA national program. Uh, so we are uh, uh, certainly uh, expected to be looking at climate change uh, indicators, uh, but, uh, but the vari variability from year to year or decade to decade through the uh, variables that, that Toby showed earlier uh, rule the day right now. Uh, but uh, we are talking with uh, some of the caretakers of some of the longer time series that we have uh, on, say, groundfish uh, to look at uh, things like whether the centers of distribution of groundfish are shifting uh, through time, which could be a climate change indicator that populations are having to move into northern waters or into deeper waters or, or not. Uh, so we are uh, starting to look into that, but um, so it's it's possible that uh, some of those uh, kinds of indicators would be available. It's not clear how informative they would be and uh, and it's up to, uh, you know, just discussions that we'll have going forward if you want those in, in the uh, annual report or not. And this is Elliot. I just wanted to add one quick thing. We, we did in, I think, the 2013 report do a risk assessment for various um, predator species to climate change as one of our sections, and I know there is also work underway that Jamil's leading on looking at some coastal pelagic species relative to climate change. So there may be a few, kind of another stay tuned for this upcoming risk webinar. We may talk a little bit more about that.
Okay, thank you very much everyone. Uh, one last call for any questions. And then I'm going to ask the ecosystem work group and Chris and Toby to stay in the line so that we can just do a postmortem. I guess the final question from me to all of you would be, does anyone have any comments or ideas about how we could better manage the forthcoming four webinars? And you can certainly send us emails about that if you have, um, you know, comments or complaints. Yvonne, I had one last question. Thank you, Deb. Um, Toby or Chris or whoever is the appropriate person, um, I, I found it really interesting that you included the um, for the um, HAB indicator a sort of a projection, and that's the only one that I can recall that you um, did that. Or is that, um, am I not remembering well, or is that, I, I would assume there aren't a lot of opportunities to do that. So I just found it kind of neat that you were able to do that and wondered if you have plans for any others. So that particular uh, product, the HAB projection, is an effort that's um, being carried out by UC Santa Cruz, uh, Rafe Cadella and Clarissa Anderson with um, uh, primarily NASA funding, but is about to go live on um, the local IUS, the CENCUS website. So that is a modeling effort that's really been led by uh, folks up at Santa Cruz, and it's it's a it's a really interesting product and it's one we hope to uh, continue. Whether others like that are going to develop, um, uh, again, I'll I'll state we're not actually creating data; we are just gathering data. So. One of the one of the, th the tools that's being developed in the IEA context uh, with uh, uh, a couple of uh, IEA scientists and partners at universities and uh, and other agencies is a short-term forecasting tool. Uh, so these would be projections uh, over the span of days or weeks rather than of uh, years or decades, uh, and this would be modeling the distribution. So the likelihood of observing uh, a fish like a sardine uh, or hake or uh, perhaps dungeness crab or tuna uh, in a given area of water at a fairly fine resolution. So these are short-term projections of the likelihoods of, uh, of species uh, being in a particular place and they're based very much on physical uh, oceanography. Uh, so um, you know you can imagine the, 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 uh, the benefits of this for either um, the fishing industry or for fisheries management of, of knowing the likelihoods that sardines are going to be off of Washington in the next few weeks or that hake are going to be off of British Columbia in the next few weeks and so on and so forth. Um, so these are these would be proje pro projections, although very, very uh, short term, because predicting weather is notoriously, notoriously difficult to do, and, and those are weather-based projections. Um, I see Steve Marks has a question, um, uh, so I guess uh, if it's okay with Yvonne, we'll take that question uh, before we wrap up. Uh, oh, Steve certainly. Is sitting, oh, certainly. Hey, uh, thanks, Kit and Yvonne, um, and everybody. Um, hopefully, folks can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. Um, First, I uh, just want to say thanks for the presentation and um, would ask if PowerPoint would be available maybe on the, on the council website. Um, if so, that would be great. Um, and then maybe kind of a question and kind of a, a comment. Uh, uh, that is, at the beginning of the presentation, there was a diagram showing how indicators um, identified development that it's last slide that we've got up here now we need to make sure that our indicators actually the national for the Steve you're you're I, I don't know about others but I you said at the beginning of the presentation and then I didn't hear anything after that. Okay. Um, sorry. 
No, yeah, if, if I cut out, that's fine. I can ask my question offline. But basically, it gets to um, a, a comment relative to the management goal question. And um, the question is, is that, a, is that a conversation that the webinars are supposed to or provide for? Or is that a conversation that either the ecosystem working group or the IEA team expects? Um, um, but it seems like at some point there needs to be an explicit conversation where um, you know we can do the management goals that you can find in individual FMPs um, and other and other related documents and really translate and map those to the discussion of which indicators and why so that we're putting to a specific I guess my question is, is that a conversation that is going to maybe happen during a council meeting, um, or is that a conversation that um, the IEA team and the working group would like to have during the webinars, um, during these next four to five webinars? Uh, so, I only caught <coughs> parts of your question, Steve, and so I'm going to try to repeat it, and then perhaps you can confirm, and then other people can let me know whether you can hear me. I think you were referring back to the September 2015 Ecosystem Workgroup Report, where we looked through the fishery management plans and the fishery ecosystem plans for sort of broad scale management goals of the council. Is that did you is that what you were referring to? Thanks. Yes, I was referring to that. Um, and then also this has been brought up a few times during uh, Chris and Toby's presentation. And so I think I heard you wondering whether we were going to be discussing those management goals in the context of the information that's provided in the annual report. And if, if I heard that question correctly, then the answer would be not on these webinars. That's probably for a conversation farther down the road and probably for a medium where we can all actually hear each other. Okay. Understood. Thanks. That makes that makes sense to me. It was just you know we we. Thanks very much. Okay, um, Steve. Uh, we we I'll just. Repeat. We we couldn't really hear you, so um, I guess really more for future reference, maybe use a telephone to log in or some other thing yeah. because of these technical issues. This is get or Vaughn. I got this is Corey. If you can hear me, I got one. Yes, Steve. we can hear you. Steve reminded me. I think I yeah, guess Steve, you trailed out there. So, but I, assuming I got the gist of what you're saying, it's kind of when. When is the opportunity for folks to get it, the input into the council and the advisory bodies? And Yvonne said some of that in the beginning. But um, on that note, I think you know, kind of the intent of this is one to ask Chris and Toby questions. But it's also you know supposed to be a, a, a dialogue of sorts between the IEA team folks. This whole webinar series and 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 uh, so I was going to ask Chris and Toby, did you have any ideas of could you give people on the line uh, some idea of when the time comes for people to give their input on on what we're hearing in these webinars and, and and give advice to the council on how to recommend to go where to go from here, are there, are there stuff that you were hoping that you'll hear from from the public and the advisory bodies? Uh, um, I would say that our goal is to make a product that is as useful for the council as possible. So we. Um, I can tell you that our next report, the draft is due the 27th of this month for the for the presentation in March, or maybe it's the 8th of February. But um, we are happy to uh, receive feedback from people. It's very helpful. There's a couple of different ways that that, that can be done. Uh, the the report and the supplementary material that we present will be in the uh, briefing book for the March meeting. 
uh, but we also uh, typically show up at the March meeting um, the day before the uh, council meeting begins, or the, the well, a couple days before the council meeting begins, and we're available the day immediately before the March meeting starts for meetings with management teams and with uh, advisory subcommittees. And I, I realize that not all uh, management teams and subcommittees are uh, available on that particular date, uh, but um, we also uh, are going to be formally uh, going to the pre-council meetings in September from um, this point forward, uh, and we began that this past year. Uh, so we're making more of an effort to be present, uh, and I think probably a lot of the kinds of questions I think that really uh, feed from what Steve Marks was asking um, and would would help us immensely and, and help hopefully help us build better communication with the uh, the uh, subcommittees and the management teams, because that's in uh, learning the council process. Uh, to be perfectly candid, and uh, and when I say we, I mean Toby and myself. Um, there, there, there could be other IEA people that know it quite well, uh, but uh, speaking for myself in particular, it, it's still uh, it's still something that I'm trying to get fluent in, and um, and it, it seems uh, as like as not that in order to really get at the key question, that, um, the key management-driven uh, questions, uh, or the key just you know uh, concerns of industry uh, that uh, that feed into the IEA as well, because we've been talking about temperature and upwelling and things, but we we think a lot about uh, the um, the needs of uh, of people uh, in coastal communities as well. Uh, the, that that opportunity is best uh, probably had in conversations um, in, in the same room. Uh, around the council meetings, and that would be a really good opportunity for us to ask uh, what the burning issues are, and uh, and then ask uh, ourselves uh, with input from the different committees whether the indicators we're looking at or, and the other tools we're using uh, have much of a hope of uh, addressing those questions in a in an informative way, or if we need to go back to the drawing board. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised. Kid, maybe um, I can just add one more thing. That, uh, that nope. the indicators are the uh, kind of the tip of the iceberg for what the IEA is working on, uh, and there are a lot of other uh, much more uh, much more in-depth analyses going on that uh, that go past just tracking time series and get more into uh, what it means in terms of the the biology and the ecology of the system. Uh, the changes due to physical variabilities uh, and what it means for uh, commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, and, and other users of the, of the ecosystem. So those conversations can go far beyond just indicator time series uh, and uh, would probably be a lot more interesting if they did. Okay. Um. So as I was saying, uh, I don't see any more hands raised. So um, I think uh, unless anybody jumps in, we're going to end the uh, webinar now. And uh, I want to thank everybody for participating and uh, remind you um, there is a second in this series uh, this Thursday at 1.30 p.m. And Three more after that. You can uh, check the dates and times if you don't have a member. So, thank you. Hey, hey, Kit. Hey, hey, Kit. Go ahead. Uh, this is Deb. Before you um, Before hang you people up, given that we had some issues with hearing people, if anyone, if there was people, someone that we didn't hear at all, perhaps they can send us an email to let us know that so we can try and prevent it in the future. That's a good idea. Um, so, good suggestion. I see uh, Richard Scully, you, you have your hand raised, so go ahead. All 
I, I don't hear Richard. Oh, I think <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll call it good and look forward to hearing, having everybody log in to future webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.